Although there is time in the program for some questions, uh, I think at this point, uh, I think it would be preferable to go to really move into our afternoon sessions uh, and to really move into uh, specific ways of trying to address these issues. And uh, the first speakers in, the, in, in this afternoon are Minna Dorm and Dr. Duncan McLean uh, from the Anna Freud Center. Uh, Minna uh, Dorm is a, a systemic practitioner. Um, who had a significant role at the Marlborough Family Services, who've pioneered uh, the multi-family um, approach uh, to working with uh, families when there are major concerns um, about uh, protection issues. Um, and uh, the unit that she's now established, uh, again with support from the Department uh, for Education, is specifically uh, aimed at trying to help uh, families where there are parents with significant personality difficulties and uh, where the impact on children's uh, development is, is significant. Uh, Dr. Duncan McLean uh, is a psychiatrist who works partly at the Maudsley with adults with personality disorders and also at the Anna Freud Clinic carrying out assessments in child uh, protection matters and also providing consultation uh, to the unit um, which uh, uh, Minna and he are going to describe in terms of its function. I'm kind of wondering how you were left feeling after this morning's talks. Um, I was, um, I'm, I'm left a little sort of uh, overwhelmed, I must say. So many facts, so many ideas. Uh, I, I'm, I'm reeling a bit about it, um, but I, I, I was left with one particular thing that I wonder what you made of, and that was the uh, last talk by Elaine, talking about the importance of authority in parenting. And um, I thought, you know, that's something I feel quite strongly about, and um, it'll play a part of my talk to some extent about the place of authority um, in systems around uh, parenting. But. Um, the thing about thinking about authority in parenting is that um, you've got to think about your own authority, and then you've got to think about, well, your own neglect. And I was thinking, what has the audience been thinking about? What, you know, what do they think about their own neglect of people and children? And uh, I started thinking about mine, and I thought, gosh, that's a long list. Um, and um, um, you wonder about uh, being an authority and giving a talk about uh, such things. Anyway, I'm going to talk about this uh, early years parenting unit, which is a practical way of um, trying to address child neglect that uh, we've developed. I'm going to look at a small area. Everybody was looking over very wide areas of systems and areas of neglect and things like that. And I'm going to focus on one particular uh, 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 area, which is just emotional neglect. I know it's very connected, as people have said, to other forms of neglect. Um, what do children need emotionally? I've got a list here. I'm sure you've all got a particular list. Um, uh, as people have said this morning, lists are, are only kind of reference points. Um, these are some of the reference points I have when I'm thinking about what do children need emotionally? Well, of course, affection. Um, measured admiration. Um, you know, I say measured because um, idealized children can uh, be in a lot of trouble themselves um, if it's not measured. Mirroring, um, I'm sure you know, all know about mirroring and, and the importance of uh, children learning about feeling states from uh, a mirroring uh, carer. Containment has been ex uh, obviously very important in terms, especially of negative affects, of you know, anxiety, anger, shame. You know, how many people think about shame in a child and uh, how, how powerful that affect state it is and how, how disruptive you shame a child a lot. Um, it is to their development and things like that. And that containing these affects in a child is, is, is a very important aspect of caregiving. Boundaries is part of that too, which is, um, helps with children with impulse control. And then lastly, what um, has been called in mentalization world, mind-mindedness. That all these other things are dependent upon the parent having a mind that thinks about the child's mind, about the child's developing mind, what that child's state of mind might be in at the beginning, how to respond to it, how to respond to it in a way that's going to help the child uh, deal with what a state of, whatever state of mind they're in. That's basically what mentalization is about. It's about the idea that a developing mind 
can only develop within the context of a mind thinking about it. Um, that you, you think about a child's mind, and in thinking about it and responding to it, you help the child develop its own theory of mind about how minds work and how relationships work and things like that. And mentalization, if it doesn't occur, leads to all sorts of difficulties people have in, in later life in terms of things that lead to the problems that people identified with this morning who've suffered from emotional neglect. I work as an adult psychiatrist, and I see uh, those adults who've had very poor parenting in the past, and they suffer from a whole range of things. And again, I've just given a, a list to kind of give you an idea about the things that come out of um, a neglect as I see it. Poor self-esteem, for example, you know, um, that they, they've not had much affection or measured admiration. Um, lack of trust in relationships. Poor impulse control, those people who've had no boundaries and things like that. Um, then poor affect recognition. There are a lot of people are adults, and this is something that adult psychiatrists often don't uh, take note of, that people who just don't know what they're feeling. Um, they're very angry, but they don't know it. They shout at the top of their heads, and um, um, you say, why are you shouting? And they say, I'm not shouting. Um, and um, uh, it's, uh, um, they don't recognize what their state of mind. And lastly, all these difficulties of emotional neglect lead ultimately to a sense of lack of agency that people have in their lives and a lack of responsibility. People like this who've had neglect feel like life happens to them. Things, people do things to them, even their own feelings do things. They lose their temper or you know, get overwhelmed by situations, get very anxious, and they, they, they feel as if life happens to them rather than they take charge of it. Mentalization is the process by which we can reflect on, think about our own state of mind, and then be able to manage it in some sort of way. Okay, the second thing I want to say about, which was said a great deal about this morning, I just want to highlight a bit, as somebody who's a practitioner working with social workers, um, and what I see in, in the area of um, uh, emotional neglect by caregivers with, in relation to their children. The first thing to say is, I think, in meeting social workers, most of them recognize emotional neglect. When they see it, they know what it is. They're human beings like the rest of us, and when they see children not getting what they need emotionally, they see it. They, it, it it's not that they have a difficulty in doing this. The problems about it are, then, from then on, what they do once they recognized it. The first thing, as people have said, it's somewhat difficult to evaluate. Um, and, and actually people then give up. They kind of can't, they don't know where to place it, as it were. They can see that something's not right, but they don't know how to sort of measure it, if you like, in their minds, and to, to think about how significant it is. And then they can turn away from it as a, as a consequence of that. They say it's easier if someone, you know, if a child's got a bruise because of, you know, they've been hit by a parent, then, then, then you know where you are. Um, if you're trying to evaluate uh, uh, emotional neglect, it's quite difficult to do. Other reasons that it's difficult to do is that actually um, parents with personality disorder grab the attention of the social worker uh, because they're quite disturbed, and the social worker then <coughs> finds it very difficult to get their attention back on the child and the child's experience. Um, so that leads them to neglect the child's uh, uh, experience. Uh, a more practical thing is that actually to, uh, you know, to evaluate neglect, you've got to see parents and children in interaction with each other over a period of time. And that can often be quite difficult for social workers to achieve. Um, they just don't have the opportunity to do that and, and, and to begin to think about what's actually going on in the caregiving between the parent and the child. Referral to other services. Um, Often, these sort of parents um, who are the, at, the, at the more serious end of emotional neglect of their children, they just don't engage with services. They're sent off to all sorts of things, and they don't turn up. They just don't, um, they don't make an engagement with helping agencies. Um, there's a lack of authority in the system, which um, re relates to what was talked about in the first thing, about how... Um, in, in social care and social workers, there isn't a backup for them to take authoritatively uh, emotional neglect. Um, and and if, if your system around you doesn't do it, then it's very easy for you to neglect it. it you can't take it further if, you're, you're, if those systems around you aren't doing it. This leads ultimately to hopelessness in social care and delay in repetitive referrals. So we um, started up, up, up a unit two years ago now. It's a Department of Education funded three-day program. Um, the uh, parents come for two full days um, um, with their children. 
Um, the parents have personality difficulties. They're not diagnosed by a, a, a psychiatrist or anything, but they're, they're identified by social workers as people who have serious difficulties with their feelings and their relationships. Um, and often they're very good at recognising these things. Um, the, the children who come to the project are under five years old, subject to child in need or child protection plans. Um, and this is the thing that's really important. There is joint working with social care throughout. There is no division between authority and therapy. Um, so that there is an agreement right from the beginning that everything is shared um, between uh, the social worker and the therapist within the unit. There is no confidentiality barrier. And it's very important that the parents realise that right from the beginning. Um, so shared concerns and consequences. So uh, I think it was talked about again by Elaine about how important it is to have very upfront um, conversations with parents about what the shared concerns are between uh, a therapeutic agency and uh, social care and that there will be consequences uh, you know, if, if the concerns aren't addressed. So this is a mentalised uh, based system uh, programme that um, looks at mentalisation both within the family, that is how is the parent thinking about parenting, how are they thinking about the child's developing mind if you like, um, um, and how are they thinking about the system around them. Also, the therapists are thinking about how the system is mentalising. How is the system thinking about the child's mind, as it were? Has it lost sight of it or not? Is it being able to think about that um, in, a, in a way that is coherent? And, and it brings both authority and uh, a therapeutic intent together. So, um, in the day programme, there is, uh, I'll just, um, Min is going to give you an example of a case in a minute. I'll just say that we do multi-family work, so several families will attend the unit in, at any one time. The program is up for, to stay up for up to 18 months, uh, uh, so it's quite long term. They do vid video work with the parents and children, so there's a lot of um, videoing of the children and parents interacting each other, which will be looked at by the therapist uh, afterwards to see how the child and the parents have interacted and for them to get feedback about that. Play with children. <coughs> But then adult groups, um, where the, the ch children are looked after by other carers um, within the unit, uh, while the parents have groups on their own, uh, on their own uh, uh, separate from their children. And these will be some of them uh, mentalizing around parenting itself, and other side of it is the adult personality difficulties that the adults have. So the aim of the thing is to be um, very comprehensive. Um, and this has been, I think, said by a lot of researchers this morning about the approach to these very complex families who've got very uh, multiple difficulties, that it needs to address all areas um, so that it's addressing parenting problems, it's addressing the adult pathology, and it's addressing child development. And the aim of the project, ultimately, is that there will either be faster resolution, because most of these cases have been in social care for, for quite a long time, um, or threatened to be so. Um, and it, by coming into the unit to see whether they can engage in a therapeutic program or not, the, we can uh, decide whether the children are going to manage in this family or not. So some of them uh, get resolved early. Um, but there are those cases that stay within the program and um, develop adequately in parenting during that time. So I'm going to hand you over to Minna, who's now going to um, hopefully talk you through a particular case to see how we work. I'm going to talk about one of the families who have been on the unit now for about six months. Um, they were referred by a, a London borough where we are uh, situated in Islington. So Shelley was 23 years old at the time, the mum, and uh, she had had quite long involvement with social care since before the birth of her uh, baby, Ruby. She had grown up in a, a difficult and chaotic family. Both of her parents used uh, quite a bit of alcohol and she witnessed a great deal of domestic violence between her father and mother, um, with her mother getting quite badly injured quite often. She described a childhood where she, her mother was very rejecting of her and she actually very much idealises her father, though it was clear that at times he physically abused her as well. So in a very kind of unpredictable way. She talks about herself having been kind of wild on the streets from when she was maybe 10 years old. Um, she often didn't go to school and she got involved in gangs and so forth. 
Um, and she was eventually thrown out of her home uh, by her parents when she was uh, 15, and she went to live in a, a hostel. So she got involved uh, with her partner, Rich, and the reason that she came to the attention of social care was that in, during her pregnancy there were incidents of domestic violence um, where she was attacked by Rich and, so, and the police were called. So that was the reason that by the time Ruby uh, was born she was already on a child in protection plan. That went down to child in need, and they, they managed, okay, they had an on-off relationship. And for the first year of Ruby's life, it appears that there are not good notes over that time, that she was managing okay, and Shelley herself um, very much idealises that time. She talks about a time when she talks about what a lovely baby Ruby was, and it's hard to know, really, because there, are, there is not uh, good evidence either way during that time. But um, she came off any kind of plan. Then at, when Ruby was about a year old, um, Shelley suffered a series of losses. Her father died um, from uh, alcohol-related illness. Uh, in quick succession, her sister died of a drug overdose, and her best friend also died uh, suddenly. So she relates everything, really, to these losses. She says at that point everything went wrong. Um, she relates all of her difficulties to um, grief, really, a, a grief reaction to that. Um, what was apparent was that she started very seriously neglecting her baby, um, and so social services became involved again. Uh, there were ongoing concerns about domestic violence as well. Um, when we set up the unit in, in uh, uh, Islington, uh, we also set up um, consultations for social workers and social work teams and other professionals who are stuck with cases. And uh, so any case where there's a kind of feeling of paralysis and no decision is made over time, they can come and talk to us um, about that. Um, and we, any, any family where social care wanted to refer them to the early years parenting unit, they would also have to go through a consultation process. It's an interesting kind of um, process, really, because uh, social workers who have become used to these consultations now talk with some relief, really, about being allowed to feel hopeless about families, to, allow, to be allowed to talk about that, because I think the world of child protection is quite a macho world in which one's own vulnerability is quite denied, really, and that's you've just got to get out there, do your job. So this is a space, in a way, where we talk to the social worker about, well, what's it like to be in the room with this mum? when you can get in the room with this mum, because quite often she would not allow um, the social worker across the threshold. Shelley herself talks about how she goes into a kind of, uh, she calls it my staring into space mode, where she's kind of like that, and if somebody uh, tries to come and intervene, she fights. That's what she does. So she can be quite abusive and so forth, or otherwise in quite a depressed state. So the social worker talked, when we were talking to him about this particular um, mum, he said, well, he, uh, part of the time I want to just be her mum, really, and look after her, and part of the time I'm frightened of her. That's what it's like to be. So having kind of got an idea about what, it, what was going on in their relationship, and the, the idea that, that social workers in particular and other professionals can get quite overwhelmed by the kind of unmet need in parents so that it really is very difficult to so focus on the, uh, the child. So then we'd start asking, well, what's Ruby doing when mum's doing this? You know, and so there's a, st there's a kind of questioning about what was happening. What was happening was that Ruby was either stuck in front of the TV or she was actually kind of pummeling and trying to burrow into her mum in an effort to get her to kind of respond in some way. So it all sounded quite worrying. Um, there was then a question about how to engage this family and um, there's a kind of engagement process that happens. It's a kind of reeling in. Um, there's a, the, the effort really is to establish the beginnings of a kind of an attachment relationship with the mum within which she can start to do some work. This was a highly mistrustful person, Shelley. She doesn't trust authority and she doesn't trust close relationships and she's got really good reasons for both of those things, really, given her experience. And another thing social workers talk about is the kind of guilt involved in working with mums who've been very badly let down as children, a kind of systemic guilt, really, which, again, functions, I think, in quite a paralysing way with uh, social workers. 
we talked about how if Shelley was going to come and to do some work, she was going to need a bit more muscle, <laughs> a bit more authority. So they, uh, and we talked about the kind of evidence they had really was, it was quite compelling to put this child on a child protection um, plan. Uh, and in a way to sort of ratchet up the authority so that it concentrated this mum's mind on things really have to change. You know, a line is being drawn here. This is not all right to carry on like this. And it was a combination of that, of doing joint visits and, and a, a kind of a ratcheting up of the authority that got Shelley into the idea that she would start to attend. Engagement with these families is an endless, relentless, nev never finishing process. It's not as if you make a relationship with them and that's okay then. On the unit, Shelley um, sometimes would just not turn up. So she, what, what happens with, I, I think especially with adults who've been seriously neglected as children, is that the way they have of telling you something about that is to disappear. They're highly, highly avoidant. So she'd suddenly, she, we get taxis sent out to bring parents in, otherwise they'd never come anyway. So um, she, she would just uh, switch off her phone and not answer the door and go to ground. So the staff on the unit talked to her a lot about that and uh, how to manage that. I'll talk about that in a little while. So thinking about the kind of approach um, that we use, it's not so much a set of a kind of toolbox. You know, it, it's very easy, I think, with families with multiple problems to think there must be some magic bullet. You know, there's something that's going to work with these families. There's some program, some particular thing that's going to work. In our minds, it's about integrated thinking. It's about not neglecting any aspect of the way that these families function um, and of keeping that whole family in mind at all times. And the effort to do that is tremendous. It's extremely hard to do because the temptation to turn away in the, in the face of this kind of overwhelming need and overwhelming problems is huge. So what we need to do is we need to work in a way with all areas <coughs> of the family and outside the family. So in terms of the system, what I'm saying is that from the beginning, there's a very close relationship with the social worker. So that in addition to writing a sort of treatment contract at the beginning, which sets out the social worker's concerns and ours and the parents and what they think about that, there's weekly contact with the social worker. And it's not just telling them what's going on. It's more keeping alive in their mind what's going on in the family in a really thinking way. So it's about what, you know, we struggle with these families. It's not easy. It doesn't all go perfectly. And social workers need to know that as well so that they're not the only ones. And they don't set us up as kind of experts who are going to get it right where they've got it wrong. There's a lot of work with the team. So Duncan and I supervise the uh, clinical team. There's a clinical team of four, a clinical manager and three therapists. And uh, in a, we spend a day a week um, on this project and we supervise the team. One of the, the most important meetings that we do with them, in, in addition to case discussion, is a reflective team. And the point of that is to help them stay in a mentalizing state maintain a capacity to think in the face of this kind of onslaught from these very, very disturbed families. So it's not as if we have a clever way of doing something and we get wedded to that way of doing things, which can quite often happen, I think, with clinicians. It's more the effort is to maintain a capacity to think. So we need to address the team's feeling or members of the team's feeling of, of, of sort of hopelessness in the face of this, for example, or indifference or anger, um, so that we need to get them back into a frame of mind where they can manage. <coughs> uh, the team works with the parent individually, uh, so each parent would have a, a key worker um, who would see them individually once a week. Uh, in Shelley's case, I think that... Um, She'd become very organised, as I say, around the losses that she'd suffered. And so some of what needs to happen is that the parents' feelings, all of the parents' feelings, are attended to. It doesn't mean that you then get so caught up with this parent's grief in this sense that you ignore the child, but they do need attending to. Then there's work done with the parent and child and with the child themselves. I think in relation to children... Very early on, a child will uh, 
learn to accommodate to their mum, say, that's their main carer, um, by not making any demands on them, for example. So, in a way, with, with direct work with children, we need to kind of re um, ignite a sense of expectation that the adult world will somehow think about them and look after them and respond to them. So I'll talk of, about a few things that w um, the team has done with this, uh, with this particular mum. So in relation to engagement, where Shelley would just go to ground and stop attending, um, her key worker worked with her by saying, look, we're not going to let you do this. There's no point in you being on this program if you don't come. Um, we need you to be here to do the work. She talked with uh, Shelley about the feelings that she had of, of kind of feeling there's just no point and getting so overwhelmed that she'd go into a quite a dissociated state sometimes and just go to ground. She said, we're going to come and get you if you don't come, so you might as well come. But the point was not to kind of go in the taxi and get the mum and do that every time as if you're looking after her. The point was to make a plan with her about what she was going to do when she felt so low that she couldn't attend. So she started attending uh, much better more recently. Uh, in individual work, again, it was, you know, where, as Duncan says, it's quite difficult for these parents to identify what they're feeling. And she would say, well, I'm depressed. And actually, it, the part of the individual work was getting her to pick apart what was going on, what, what, what was so she used a bit of art. You know, she, she, she said, what would it look like if you drew it? She drew an iceberg, and the top of the iceberg was her like this. And the bottom of the iceberg was massive anxiety about all kinds of aspects of her life. Um, some of which, you know, I don't understand how some of these parents manage. This mum is in temporary accommodation in a horrible, damp basement with her child. The new family moved in down the corridor who are um, both uh, heroin addicts. Police are called all the time. It's traumatising every night. There's this, you know, she did a recording of it so that we could hear it. <laughs> And uh, I don't understand how a parent and therefore a child can feel any sense of safety in that situation. It's not easy. So we wouldn't just ignore that and say, well, never mind, that's where you are. You still have to look after your child. Her key workers worked with her about finding a, a housing solicitor, writing to her MP, you know, doing what it, whatever it takes to make uh, her life different and not really give up in the face of that kind of hopelessness. Um, in the MBT group, uh, Shelley at the beginning was absolutely terrified to say anything. She thought if she said anything at all, she'd have her child taken away. And that was where she started. And in a way, I think what's helped her most in that group is, is hearing other parents say very difficult things and have them talked about. And the um, relationship with social care is such that we will tell them what's going on, but we're not going to have a knee-jerk reaction that says, you said that, your child's out. So it's this, this feeling of holding them in mind in a mentalising way, not keeping secrets, but not just um, reacting in a knee-jerk way. And she's become quite vocal in the group. There was another um, parent, it was only last week actually, who's neglecting herself very badly. She's got diabetes and she'd failed to take her insulin and she went into a kind of a semi-hypo. And um, uh, the staff on the unit was saying, just, just eat this sweet thing. We need to deal with this first and then we can talk about how come you got into that situation. Shelley just said, eat the frigging chocolate, will you? <laughs> she was quite sweet actually, because she did. Um, so, so, you know, and then they, she said, now's not the time to bloody mentalise, you've got to eat the chocolate. So which is quite right. <laughs> so, it, you know, in a way, and then once that this mum, had, the other mum had kind of got into a state where she was thinking again, she said, I used to be just like you. I, this was Shelley talking. I used to just do nothing. I was so neglectful of myself. And how can I possibly think about my child when I'm in that neglectful state? So... Parents say quite powerful things to each other, actually. So in the parenting group, so it's a mentalisation-based group, but it's focusing on children, and there's all the ordinary things that people talk about. You know, what's play about, and what's it for, and why is it important? And Shelley would say, well, she'd never been played with as a child, so actually the experience of playing with her child was really just embarrassing actually, she didn't know where to start and what she did, um, what she has a tendency to do is to set up quite elaborate play areas as if you're in a kind of play centre 
and it's all perfect. And then, of course, her little girl, Ruby, comes in and just disregards everything. <laughs> so, um, so there's this sort of uh, pattern she gets into of kind of idealisation and disappointment, which is very painful, actually. So working with the child, working with Ruby is, as I say, quite an important part of the work as well because you need to break the circular pattern of what's going on between the parent and the child. So when Ruby arrived, she, the staff, uh, ref they described her as a feral child. She ran around everywhere. She was quite out of control. She didn't use language at all. She, hadn't, she had just simply hadn't really developed it. She was three years old by this time. She growled. When anyone came near her, she growled. And when you talk to mum about it, she say, well, she growls because I growl. So, well, that's a start. But we, so the, the first thing was to give her some kind of an experience of emotional attunement. So staff would play alongside her and um, just start to comment a little bit on what she was playing. Just start. And she... Um, she has good days and bad days, actually, Ruby, but on her good days, she would love it. So that when they didn't say something about what she's doing, she'd say, you didn't say what I did, sort of thing. So she was starting to, you know, want that kind of interaction. On other days, she'd say, you're being annoying, go and sit over there, kind of thing. So she would do different things. But what you're doing really is to raise her expectations that, that, that someone has a mind that's thinking about her mind so that she's actually progressed quite a bit and I think some of that progression has been to do with that one-to-one -one work that the adults have been doing with her. Another thing which I think gets ignored, uh, many of the children who are on the unit, little children, but they can be so difficult that there's a wish to just keep them away from the other children because it's going to be horrible. She, she, uh, because she did have this tendency when she started, if anyone came near her, she would sh you know, growl and hit out. So you, there's this sort of well, let's have just one person working with her and one person working with the other child. That is going to help them to an extent. You're sort of starting from where they are, but they need the experience of being able to negotiate with their peers. And so with Ruby, she started being quite unable to do that. Now she can kind of play alongside for maybe half an hour. And when there was a new family on the unit, actually only last week, she sat down next to her key worker and said who's that little girl? And she said so-and-so. And she said, do you think she might want to play with me? And this is extraordinary coming from Ruby. It really is. So it's, it feels quite heartening when you see experiences like that. With Shelley and Ruby, I think the first thing to say is that risk needs to be kept at the forefront. What we don't want to do is get all marvellously idealising about our way of working so that we don't notice when it's not working. See what I mean? And we don't, when we're, we're tempted to just not notice how badly things are going between this parent and this child sometimes. So where, where you see behaviour that is just unacceptable, you just say, don't do it. So one of the things um, that Shelley used to do was be at the other end of the unit from her child. Well, that's no good. <laughs> so you go, Ruby's over there. You're over here. That's not all right. Get, I don't care what you're doing, but you've got to be in the same room as your child. Start doing things like that. When she was on her bad days, Shelley would uh, be quite mean to uh, Ruby, so that if Ruby got upset, she'd start imitating her voice, and it's quite sadistic, really, and we'd say, that's not all right. Um, beyond that, it's really about arousing Shelley's curiosity about uh, Ruby as a separate being from her, and start to think about... Uh, what she might need and what she's doing and start in a really quite ordinary way to build a kind of uh, uh, curiosity about her and then to start practicing being a bit attuned to her. So one of the things that we do use quite a bit is video feedback. Um, as you know, there's all kinds of programs, video feedback programs, which are highly stage managed actually and are quite didactic, many of them. I think video is extremely powerful but in some ways, I think it's, it's, it's helpful to just use it in a slightly more flexible way, in a sort of real way. So what um, the staff do with these families is that they say to each family has a special time of 10 minutes where they go into a particular room where, with a video camera there and they're asked to just play with their child and follow their child. That's it. 
And then, they, then the parents will look at some of that video with the other parents, which is, I think, a very brave thing to do. I'm not sure I'd want to do it with my child. <clears throat> so I just um, want to show you a very, um, very short, possibly too short, uh, couple of clips about um, Shelley and Ruby. Um, in the first one, which was um, a few months ago, there's two, sort of two clips. So this is right at the beginning of, uh, of their... Just wondering if this is going to work. So what I found interesting about that is what she would normally do, Shelley, would be like, what are you doing that for? <laughs> and she could see she stopped herself. She kind of went, whoops, like this. But actually, she couldn't kind of address what Ruby was doing in quite a helpful way. Say, oh, what you... and she's very silent as well, which is something um, that Shelley does. I don't know what other people thought of that. This is a little bit later on in the same session. And what I'm interested in is what Ruby is... is I think for, for Ruby, being in, in the same room as her mum is actually quite a challenge. Um, her mum could be quite unpredictable. It wasn't all about neglect. But for both of them, this is a very edgy situation, and you'll see how Ruby uh, deals with it. In common with many children who have a kind of highly avoidant and sometimes disorganised attachment pattern, Ruby's gone into a really controlling way of being, hasn't she? She's like that with other children, she's like that with staff, and she's like that with her mum. So she, at that mum had been sitting silently watching her, absolutely silently, and then thought, better get on the floor. Gets on the floor and Ruby says, get back on your chair. <laughs> so I'm just going to show you one really last clip, which is where I see them having the beginnings of a conversation, that serve and return thing that somebody talked about right at the beginning of today. So she's doing a jigsaw puzzle, and it's, it's Mum's choice to do that, not Ruby's. Sorry. See what I mean? So it's just working very slowly to begin that kind of where they're really both taking a big risk, actually, by being with each other. And, uh, and she's just starting. That was the first time I saw her really being a parent in the room, actually, with her child. OK, so I'm going to stop there. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Duncan and Minna, for a very powerful uh, demonstration of, uh, of the change that can be achieved. So uh, are there some points that people would like to, to raise? Uh, Elaine Rose, child and family trainer and uh, child psychotherapist. It's truly fascinating, and uh, thank you very much. 
You spoke about igniting or reigniting the sense of hope in the children and the parents, and I wondered if you could talk something about the endings and how you manage uh, the transition of the ending of your work, because clearly very often they won't be that support. Um, just working. Yeah. Um, uh, families get very attached to the unit, and it's really that's what we're working with. If they don't form an attachment, they're not going to manage uh, to make changes. Uh, they're also very reluctant to leave the ones who do uh, manage to make it through. Um, they, we do a lot of work around goodbyes, but beyond that, because the, one's anxiety is raised as they're getting towards leaving, because it's never perfect, and of course they're going to start showing you how difficult their lives are just towards the end. But what we have is a, we have um, a sort of a series of individual appointments for the mum or the dad, whoever's attending, um, with their key worker that go from weekly and then they go to monthly, two monthly. And we also have a leavers group for, for families who've gone through the unit and left. So they, because they, uh, they establish pretty strong relationships actually, and uh, so they manage to maintain those relationships. They all live fairly nearby to each other. So it's, it's, it's they carry on using the way that they've learned to think on the unit sort of outside it. So that's what we do. Yeah. Hi, I'm Caroline Newbell, Children's Social Care in Oxfordshire. I just wondered if you could tell us, in relation to that case, what, what it was you saw in that mum and child which made you think it was worth trying your programme? Because it was, there was a lot of work to do. We saw from the snippets. I want, and you obviously can't take everybody. What, what did you see? Well, I don't think we necessarily see anything at the beginning. We, we, we take these cases on the basis of a social worker saying that they're stuck with it, they don't know where to go, they don't know if they've got enough evidence to take it further in terms of removing the child. Uh, they're not sure whether this mother can change or not. We don't know either. Um, so each time that we take somebody on, it is a bit of a trial, actually. Um, um, and um, we, we try and see if they can get involved and do the work with us. Some of them don't do that. But it becomes something then that actually becomes much firmer evidence that social workers have for then escalating the case and going to court. Because we have very clear evidence, both that they are emotionally neglecting their child, because we've got a lot of detailed observational evidence, and secondly, um, we've got the ability to show that actually they can't work with people. Um, that they, they've had a really intensive try and they can't work. And actually, it, it leads to much quicker resolution as a consequence of that. So we don't, we don't prejudge them. We don't say, you know, before they come, we know they can do it or not. We don't, we don't have to have evidence that they can. And nearly all of them come reluctantly. Um, you know, they, they don't trust professionals at all. They're all people who've been offered services before and turned them down. Um, so so they're, they're pushed by their social worker to come. Uh, the question is, Jane Barlow was saying, what proportion actually don't, uh, you're not able to continue work with and have to? Well, we, ha we haven't been running the programme very long yet, and it's, it's an 18-month programme. It's not actually been running much longer than eight. We've only had our first um, you know, cohort of people actually go through, so it's difficult to give you very clear statistics about that. Um, but we, Minna was thinking about 30% don't make it. And what's quite interesting is watching how the other parents manage the fact that somebody would come onto the programme with their baby and that would end in care proceedings and having the baby removed. I think what's most heartening, honestly, is uh, that there was a young mum who had her baby removed quite recently. And so we, uh, Duncan and I meet the families about once every six weeks to see how they're getting on. So we have a group of the parents. And uh, this mum, the one who was about to lose her baby, she was effing and blinding about social services. They just, if they just get off my back. And another parent said, well, if social care were involved with your family, they're probably involved because they're worried about your baby. And if they are worried about your baby, it's probably for a really good reason. And you think, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think, thank you very much. But I think there was one last question here, yes. <coughs> Hi.
Hi, I'm Tony Stanley, Principal Child and Family Social Worker at Tower Hamlets. I'm really interested in the place of extended family and communities around your program and thinking of the work done between the sessions uh, that social workers might be able to lead on that reinforces some of the learning and the wider family in terms of their role in all of this. I think the point is for us that we need to understand that family's whole network and we need to talk with a social worker about that. Um, one thing that worries me greatly is any kind of assumption that extended family is necessarily a good thing. <laughs> this uh, this mum was constantly trying to make her mum proud of her um, and failing every time. So we certainly would talk with the mum about her relationships and the social worker. If there's if there are positive aspects or negative aspects, they need to be thought about as part of the programme. So to the, what we can't do is leave them out. So we might want to see that mum's mum, for example, or we might want the social worker to understand a bit more about what's going on there, you know, how far she's involved and so on, what, if, if any, any kind of support she can, get, she can give that's genuine support rather than undermining her parenting. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Minna and Duncan, for a very fascinating account, and, uh, and thank you for your questions and the points that have come up in discussion.